Thank you for coming out to Mass today with the weather as it is. The disciples tell Jesus, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? And he even responds, does this shock you? That's obviously at the end of John chapter 6, talking about the true presence of Jesus Christ in the Most Holy Eucharist. We may be tempted to say this after this reading from St. Paul. This reading is hard, and does St. Paul may say, does it shock you, right? Let's talk about it. What is St. Paul saying here? The simple thing to do, I would suggest, is go home and read the whole letter to the Ephesians. It will take you about 25 minutes. There's not much else you can do today in New York City. You can probably read it twice if you want to. What you will find, I'm not going to go in detail, don't worry, but if you read the first three chapters, you will see Paul have this mystical understanding of the greatness of God's love. You have probably heard that God loves you, and that's true, and those are words, and they signify reality, but those words are puny in relationship to the reality of what we're actually talking about, and St. Paul expands those simple ideas that God loves you, and for three chapters, he continually blows your mind, just expanding the intellectual capacity to understand this great love of God. In the very beginning of chapter 4, he says, therefore, and then he just gives you a whole way of life following what it means to follow this God of love. A whole new way of being. In, in one sense, he says, you have to put away the old man. You can think about Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, and put on the new man, thinking about Jesus Christ. He also puts it in terms of do no, no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. We have to live in a new way because of how great God loves us. And the very first thing he says is we must live with lowliness, also humility, with gentleness, also meekness, different translations. That's the tone of Ephesians 4 through 6. Now the danger is when we come to this passage, especially when it's in isolation, We don't come to it with the new man, but we come with the old man. We think of it in terms of power and control. That's the very thing that Paul said not to do. That's the way of the old man, right? This was the curse of Genesis 3, when God tells Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will dominate you. That's the way of the old Adam, and that's still in our bones because of original sin, but we also are baptized. Something new is at work within us. And that we are not to live as, or as worldly, right? So he, Paul is giving a vision of marriage that would be rather shocking to the Romans and the Greeks of his time, and it's still shocking to us in New York City. So let's dump, jump into it a little bit, right? So he tells wives to be subordinate, but subordinate as Christians. Christians are not slaves. Other religions understand people as slaves, not Christianity. We are sons. We are daughters. At the Last Supper, Jesus Christ looks at his disciples and says, no longer do I call you slaves. I call you friends. Everything I have, the Father has told me, I have shared with you. This is the subordination of friends. And that's a real subordination, right? If a colleague asks for a favor in the workplace, I'm probably going to say no. If a friend asks for a favor, I kind of have to say yes. When we're friends, you have to obey each other. Not out of a slavish obedience, but there's a real obedience of friendship to, to make way for your friend, to help them out, and to even give your heart to your friend. That is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a friendship that has this mutual obedience, this attending to, this loving, this giving your heart. And then for the husbands, this is all the more shocking, especially for Romans and Greeks. Simply the idea of husbands love your wives was very shocking at the time. Why? Well, because if you're a nobleman, you marry a noble woman who you respect. You respect her very much. You put her in charge of, her, of your household. You give her a couple legitimate children. But you give your love, to put it nicely, to women of other social statuses. And you can do whatever you want there. This separation of love from marriage was just 
part of pagan life. It's a lot easier to give your love to people you can dominate and then just give a couple of children to your wife and let her control the household. Paul is saying we don't do that as Christians. That's a pagan way. As Christians, not only do you respect your wife, you love her. You're faithful to her. Only to her. And not only that, but you are to love her not just as a good man, you are to love her in the very image of Jesus Christ. And here he invokes both the crucifixion with the blood and water coming out to cleanse the church, but you also can hear a whisper of the washing of the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. Jesus Christ washes the disciples' feet. And here again, to go back to the wife, this might give us a little insight what it means to be subordinate because Peter didn't want it. He said, do you wash my feet, Lord? He says, if you want a part of me, yes. That is the subordination we have to Christ. We let him wash our feet. We let him forgive us in confession. It's free. Usually the priest is nice, but it takes subordination to go to it. It takes humility to submit ourselves to a priest telling you that God loves you and forgives you. But it's it's not easy. I'm scared too to go to confession, right? But this is a subordination that we have as Christians to let Christ wash our feet. This is radically different from the way that pagans thought. This is a Christian way of doing this. Now, for all of you who are married here, the great call is that your marriage should not just be according to the way of the world. The world gets some things right, but when it comes to marriage, it gets a lot of things wonky, right? It needs to take time to think, how is our marriage different than that of the world? Not in a state of superiority, like, oh, we're so much better because we're Catholics, we go to a fancy church and it has incense, but because... Well, Christ loves us so much. And we need to welcome his love, not just into the church of our life, but into the dining room, into the bedroom, into every part of our life. And what does that do to our marriage? Don't have that conversation on an empty stomach. Have a big meal first, and then husbands should tell their wives when you first fell in love with them, when you want to marry her, and then have that conversation. How does the love of Jesus Christ change our marriage? What's different from a Christian marriage than a worldly marriage? But this reading is not just for married couples. It's for the whole church. First and foremost, because we have the job of fostering holy marriages. And the simplest way to do that, I would suggest, is welcoming children as blessings. If you hear a child cry at Mass, say a prayer of thanksgiving. Say, hopefully they don't start screaming. There's a difference there, but if you've got a couple like little noises, think about Christmas, Jesus. It wasn't always a silent night, right? There was some crying there too. To give thanks and praise for the gift of a child. But even more in all of this, St. Paul is revealing to each of us that Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. The bridegroom of the whole church, and the bridegroom of each member of the church. He has the love that alone can satisfy. He doesn't work alone. He brings all of his friends, all of heaven with him. But he alone, he alone has the love that truly satisfies. That's true if you're married, if you're single, if you're a sister, if you're a priest, whoever you are, wherever you are today, it's the love of Jesus Christ that alone satisfies. Now, saying all this doesn't make this teaching all the easier. In fact, it makes it all the more difficult. You know the rules the church has about marriage. They're not easy to follow. And in fact, many people will leave the church just as they do in John 6 because these teachings are hard. And they go back to their former way of life. Former way of life. But as St. Paul says in the letter of the Hebrews, we are not of those who shrink back out of fear. Rather, we run ahead out of faith. Let us entrust ourselves, especially to Mary this day, Mary, Queen of heaven and earth, that she would grant this faith to all of us, in Jesus Christ, our bridegroom, that there will be many holy couples supported by the prayers of the saints, 
supported by the prayers of the church, that all would come to know Jesus Christ as the bridegroom, the one love that can satisfy. 